I'm going to send the sheet around here, so you'll have to sign here for the morning session. Um, nah, okay, so. All right, now let's move along here. So again, for the continuity of the lecture and just for the fact that a lot of questions I think will be answered as we I complete the analysis here. So we'll, I will take, definitely will take questions on this topic because this is one I know uh, everybody, except for two of you, have questions on. So, uh, so, all right. So, so as we think about these scenarios, and again, some of you asked about the trying to abbreviate here. It's one of my on my to-do list with the other twenty thousand things is to actually make a fleshed-out full full chart, uh, putting this thing to make it to simplify it for you. But um, point is, look, hard determinism can't be otherwise. Will is caused by external, immediate, efficient cause. You don't move your own will. There's no secondary causation. Boom. Here, things are determined in the sense that you know they're going to happen and they can't be otherwise. The will is self-moved. There's secondary free causation. That's acknowledged by the compatibilist. And according to the compatibilist, not only is that a necessary condition, for free choice, it's the sufficient one. That's all you need, okay? And then the result in a theistic view, you still have the certainty of divine foreknowledge, okay? God knows the future, okay? Libertarian Arminian view, yes, uh, the will is self-moved, there is secondary free causation, and while that's a necessary condition, it's not the only condition that we need for freedom. We also need counterfactuals of creaturely freedom. We need the principle of alternative possibility, meaning in every instance of free choice in which you can find yourself, you have to be able to choose otherwise. Okay? And at the same time, you know, again, the, the, the biblical, classic, you know, and Molinist, uh, libertarian, Arminian says, of course God knows the future. You know, the Bible teaches it, and we teach God knows the future. Now, the libertarian open theist says, Got to have a self-move will. We need counterfactuals of creaturely freedom. But they would assert that if God, uh, if, if we can choose otherwise, then God can't have certainty of our choices. He only has a high probability of what will occur. So he doesn't have a future with certainty. No. That, that's a defining characteristic of libertarian freedom. Hold the questions till the end. So again... So hold all that. We're going to get to all this. So, um, and then we'll flesh this stuff out and make some, make some stuff. Now, um, so those are the four basic scenarios that, that we're going to do. Now, here's the problem. Okay? As I said, often there's a lot of things left out of the discussions when you're approaching this from a strict you know, philosophy or apologetic basis. Like, did you consider monotheism in your discussion? Did you consider the fact that God still decided to make people he knew would never be saved? Did you do, you know, the fact that God is God, and if he, didn't, if he did create us uh, without free will, and he praises us and blames us, then who are you going to appeal to? Okay. See, these kinds of things, you know, really have to be set in motion before you even, you know, do this. Now, if you're getting to the apologetic issue, but people are asking these questions, question is, will this really satisfy them in any way? You know, or what do you need to do is go back to, look, God is God, and you know, if you don't like it, talk to him about it. What he has said is repent and come to Christ. Okay, So just do it. So that's, the, um, um, that's one way to approach it. So look at page four, the handout now. And here's something to, again, if you're going to do any kind of free choice analysis, there are seven basic factors to consider, all right? And you can't just choose a couple of them. You have to deal with all of them if you're going to deal with a free choice scenario. First, are there any external agents involved? And if so, what do they do, okay, in the choice? I already talked about that. Um, the idea of a material and internal cause, this is a big one. Material cause, if you look on page six, says it's the substantial basis for the motion or mutation, the material on which 
the efficient cause operates. In other words, what's your nature? What's your substance in a given time? What are your inclinations? Uh, what's your dispositional knowledge? Where, how are you inclined one way or another? Your experiences, all of that. And even more importantly, I'll tell you that this is why I love studying 17th and 18th century scholastic theology. They just covered everything. Didn't leave any stone unturned. Um, something that's frequently left out of these free choice debates is the concept of liberty of nature and necessity of nature. And that's why when you look at, um, look at page five of the handout, and th those two things are some of the most important things to consider in the free choice issue. So because someone asked right during the break, what about total depravity or inability or something like that? Well, let's, let's look at that because that's exactly the issue here. Um, necessity of nature and liberty of nature. What's necessity of nature? The limit of thought and action grounded in a being itself. It's not an externally imposed type of necessity and it simply means no being can act against its own nature, period. Liberty of nature is the flip side of that. It's the freedom that's proper to a being given its particular nature. Okay, So, start with an obvious example. Okay. Now, let, let's take you know, your dog. Okay, If your dog had libertarian free will, okay, your dog could not choose Christ for salvation because you're limited by a dog nature what a dog can do. The, the dog with libertarian nature, an alternative possibility, couldn't choose what? Couldn't choose to engage in the Calvinist Arminian debate, okay? Because uh, they're not equipped to do so. So this is why, you know, and again, that's just, you know, uh, obviously it's sort of a farce example, but it's clear cut that a thing is limited by its nature. So it really doesn't matter whether it's libertarian or compatibilist or anything else. First thing you got to consider is the nature of the thing involved. So, so this is why you know when you get to the real question of free choice is this: when you get into some kind of you know strict Augustinianism, where man has fallen, our hearts are bad, and there's a total inability of man to make a first movement to wa even want God. Okay. Now give that person libertarian free will. Is there any possibility they're going to choose Christ for salvation? No, because it's not within their nature to do so. They could freely choose, you know, again, you know, Chinese, Bacon, you know, uh, you know, Biola, some lesser college, you know, all that stuff, you know. Um, it's within your nature to do that. But you can't do this because you're fallen. It's not within your nature to do so. So that's why the nature question, uh, liberty of nature, necessity of nature, uh, is the issue, is that things are limited by their natures. And, and this is why God is an immutable holy being. So guess what? He's limited. It says he can't sin, period. Um, every, every being, whether it's God or us, can't make a two-horn unicorn or a square circle. Um, it's just nobody can make something that's logically impossible to make or do something that's logically impossible to do. So, so the actual material, you know, again, the material cause, the nature of the object is a big issue, and that's why you have to go back and decide, look, does the Bible teach inability of man? If it teaches the inability of man, then all this stuff becomes virtually, you know, perfunctory or, you know, almost irrelevant in the debate until you've settled whether or not man has ability and when man would have ability to actually make a choice for Christ for salvation. So that's a, that's a scenario, which is, by the way, um, when you look at the alleged five points of Calvinism, uh, when I say alleged because there's more than five points to Calvinism, remember, the five points were a response to the followers of Jacob Arminius, you know, Simon Episcopius and so forth, you know, who were, in, who were Calvinist within the Calvinistic camp. And they said, you know, even though the confessions are in place and we've thought through this stuff, we'd like an exception on these five points. And which was what? You know, well, there's no, there isn't really a total inability. Uh, 
there isn't really, uh, election is really conditional, not unconditional. Uh, the, the, the intent of the atonement is really universal, not limited. And see, and what was the response at the Synod of Dort? No. Okay. <laughs> and in response, here's, the, in, in response to your five petitions, here's our five statements. And uh, no, this is what we currently hold. It's in our creeds and confessions. And if you don't like it, you know, there's the libertarian door. Uh, so, so that's, uh, and that's when you saw the beginnings of the Armenian denominations and so forth. But the uh, point was is that this started as a controversy within the Reformed or Calvinistic uh, uh, circles. And from that, we saw the, the Armenian denominations form. So, so on that, so you have material and internal causes, big one. Back to page four. Number three, how does God fit into the picture? Um, See, getting to this is meaningless in monotheism until you've gotten to the decree, divine omniscience, uh, divine pro all that stuff, how, how God really thought about it, decreed it, worked. You know, this comes afterwards. So, but see, if an atheist is trying to think about a free will question, again, you know, there's the question. There is no free choice in atheism. You're just dust in a blender. And, uh, you know, what, what physical particle is self-moved instead of moved by something else? You know, that, that's always the biggest problem is that there really isn't any life and matter in and of itself. It has to be animated by something else or moved by something else. So you have to get hard determinism in, atheist, in an atheistic physicalist world. So how does God fit in the picture? Uh, the practical intellect, okay? Uh, how does the, you know, again, how does the intellect precede the will? What are you deliberating about? You know, what's your knowledge that you have? Um, the goodness or evil of the object itself, you know, that's part of the, uh, again, subset of the material and internal causes. Um, think about free choice. How about the event itself under consideration? I mean, think about this. Right now, can any of you in the next two seconds decide to go swimming and actually go swimming? No, because there's no, you, yeah, you can decide to do it, but can you actually choose to go swimming right now in the sense of engage in the act of swimming? No, there's no water around, okay? So every free choice, yeah, but, you know, water in your mind doesn't count, okay? We're talking about <laughs> water in reality is what you need. The point is every, you know, uh, Every single free choice you make is dependent on your antecedent and concurrent conditions. Or even we think about, uh, you know, uh, second order, first order choices. You know, you have a, for example, if you don't know how to speak Swahili, you can't freely choose to speak Swahili right now. But you might have a, a, a second order capacity of language learning, learn the language, and then you'll have a first order capacity to speak Swahili and freely choose to do it. So, so even that, you have to think about, well, what's the event I'm supposed to be freely choosing, okay, involved? And then in the free choice analysis, the very, the, the issue of existence, um, we got right back to our scenario in the decree. This is where people get, uh, you know, get really interested about this stuff, but on election and reprobation, that's what we're really concerned about. Praise, because that's <laughs> praise, blame, right? You know, good, bad. That's the uh, uh, the point is, is see, when we start using language like foresee and something like that, it, it can't be understood with the existence of the object in mind, that you're really sort of perceiving the object in mind, and that it's really, this is still God just thinking, conceiving, of scenarios, things, you know, people he might make, situations in which he can place them. Uh, and so again, you know, say, so what does it mean to foresee that someone will believe or would believe? Uh, so, and uh, so, so that becomes part of the, again, the scenario here. So all of those have to be part of your free choice analysis for you to have a complete free choice analysis. Um, now, What's important here, bottom of page four, clarify the type of cause, okay? 
Um, in other words, if you're going to say cause of the will, this is what goes on. Do, what do you mean? Efficient, impelling, proximate, material. If you don't decide this uh, and you don't clarify, it's going to leave people wondering what you really mean. Okay. So that's the, um, those are the basics of doing a free choice analysis. And now, when we get to the doctrine of the divine decree, which we're going to get to now and sort of thinking about the, the aspects of it, we're going to talk about how that relates to sin, agent causation, efficacy, uh, and all of that. But see, now go ahead, a couple of questions if you have questions. Yeah. I just call him Uncle Clive. So. <laughs> Um, no, but uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the problem is, is to raise that and to raise the issue of time. And again, the problem with that is see, C.S. Lewis isn't around to ask him what he, to clarify certain things, so that, that's the problem. Um, but the problem is as soon as uh, you raise the issue of time, I mean, in one sense, how is time relevant to the equation? See, because the way he describes that there, he's really describing what seems to be a static view of time as opposed to a dynamic view of time. A, a static view, huh? Yeah, so you talk about A and B theory, but I don't, people start going, you know, P and Q, if P, therefore Q, you know. Yeah, we can see, you know, I've, I've taken logic, you can take, you know, modus, po modus ponens, modus tollens, you can do all this stuff. But you sort of hurt communication when you start going for symbols for everything, and then one person in the room knows what the symbols mean, uh, you know. Um, so that's why, again, I, I prefer descriptive terms like static and dynamic instead of A and B time or something like that. So, um, so again, what's static time? And this is actually an issue with creation, uh, you know, w whether or not God is temporal, whether or not God is uh, uh, atemporal. But either way, you get to static time, what are you really saying? You're saying time doesn't move, it's static. It all exists at once. Which there, the important thing is you're making an ontological claim, you're saying it exists. See, static time says the past, present, and future all exist at once. And this is, so this is what you hear about, you know, the, the, the time-space continuum, okay? Is that, but see, to say, that it exists, the past exists, the future exists, in, in some sense. Well, here's the problem. It's a scenario I raised earlier. If the past exists, the present exists, well, let's say this is the year 2000, you know, this is 2013, and this is 2113. You know, it's relative, right? For us, in 2013, this is the present, but for the people who exist now, in the year 2000, in a static time scenario, 2013 is the future. You know, the people who are in 20, 2113, to us it's the future, but to them this is the present, so relativity. So when you make that kind of claim that for God it's the eternal now, well, it, it's in effect saying that, look, if you mean this, God knows the world and everything in it that ever will be, as a conceptual model. But yeah, for him, he knows it simultaneously and, and has always known it. So if that's what you mean by now, okay, so God has free knowledge, <laughs> okay? And again, it's conceptual knowledge because 
But the way that C people use that C.S. Lewis quote often, and it just sounds a whole lot like perceptual knowledge when you say it, that God is looking at something, he's viewing something. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I mean, is that we really can't clarify. That's why he's not around to clarify. So that's why we have to clarify ourselves. Well, if it means this, then it means God's got an eternal creation that he's looking at, and for them, in the sense, it's an eternal now, uh, which is, no, that can't be true because the doctrine of ex nihilo creation and so forth. So, so that's the problem there. So again, we stay here in conceptual knowledge. And in that sense, yeah, God has a con conception of everything that will occur and at the same time when he creates the world which continues to exist in chronological succession um, then does he know at every given moment everywhere at all times exactly what will happen yeah yeah so he's not only got a conceptual knowledge at that point but once you've got creation he also has a perceptual knowledge because now something exists to perceive so that's why you have to, you know, clarify it that way. Go ahead. Yeah. Be some things are, some things aren't. You know, when when the rock or boulder falls off, you know, based on you know gravity, natural law, things that don't involve agent causation or counterfactuals. God can know those with certainty, but he can't know human free choices with certainty. The problem with, with doing any of this kind of stuff is that there isn't a single like ecumenical creed of, uh, you know, uh, of open theists where you can say, you know, this is exactly what we believe on everything. What you've got to look at are individual writers like Pinnock and Sanders and Boyd and, and, and people like that. Um, so yeah, they're going to say something God knows. But he's going to say what he can't know. It doesn't say he doesn't. He says he can't know with certainty what we're going to, what any agent with libertarian free choice would choose in any given moment. Okay? Yeah. It seems like it all gets connected because he might know the rock or the boulder is going to fall off the cliff and have it naturally. But sometimes we as agents can push the rock off the cliff. And that might you know, be the first domino that causes. Yep. You know, it seems like he can't know anything. Yeah. Well, I, see, I agree, and I think that's the, 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 the correct scenario uh, on that. that uh, so you want to try and save some divine foreknowledge, but not others. But I agree that, you know, well, if you and your free choice, you know, move the rock, uh, you know, then God didn't know you're going to move the rock because that was alternative possibility uh, that you had an ability to do. And that's the, uh, you know, that, that's where you end up. Any, uh, yeah. Yeah, and again, I, I can't remember exactly what he said, but if that's what he said, I, I don't understand what he said either. So, <laughs> I mean, because, well, again, it, it depends. See, when you say efficacious, uh, if, you're, if you mean that, how do Calvinists teach what efficacious grace is, okay? Because when you talk about everything from prevenient grace, something that comes beforehand, Calvinist Arminians have different views of what prevenient grace is. Um, efficacious grace, if you take you know, the concept of what's efficacious, and the real issue there is that it's efficient, okay? It's efficiency. In other words, it actually effects that which it intends to effect. That's what efficient grace is, or efficacy. Or, so that's why, you know, more precisely, efficacious grace in salvation would be the kind of grace that if it's given will actually affect salvation. 
So this is why in the, uh, again, in a, the Calvinistic total inability scenario, if man can't make a first movement to God, then is there anything, we, well, first we'll see, is there anything we can do for salvation? No, you know, there's righteousness can't come through the law and all that. So, but either way, um, uh, we, have to, we still have to have faith. And, you know, again, we'll look at the sole condition for salvation is faith. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's what we have to do, trust God. Now, efficacious grace, the way it is generally construed in the Calvinistic scenario is that if God wants you saved, he already has the elect in mind, he gives you everything you need to be saved, and you will be saved. It's efficient. God doesn't fail in what he plans to do. And that's, so generally, that's what that means. Now, on a more precise level, when you look at what they call the order of salvation, that's going to differ between the Lutherans, the Arminians, you know, the Calvinists, and you know, exactly what the order is of faith, regeneration, and how all that works. But... Um, Efficacious grace for the confessional Calvinist ultimately is going to be regeneration, okay? Because you can't, a leopard can't, according to, you know, if you're if total inability, you need your nature changed before you're going to have faith. So f regeneration logically and causally has to precede faith in the individual. But if you're regenerate, then what are you? You're, you're already saved, and then the other things are going to naturally follow. Uh, now, saved, that's where we're going to get to that. Saved means justified, adopted, regenerated, and all those things. But ultimately, if God gives you a new nature, where now you, your heart wants the things of God, and you don't have a total inability, uh, again, the, the, the way the scenario is, is that, well, that's done in the context of gospel preaching. And then, because now you have a nature that wants to respond, you understand your condition uh, of, you know, that you're in, and now you want to respond because you have a new, a new nature. So, so the question, so the, so the idea of, you know, how, if that's what he said, and I don't remember exactly how he said it in the book, but I think he, that was close. Um, remember, that's the liberty of nature, necessity of nature question. If it's total inability, offering, saying I'm offering someone efficient grace, um, well, what does that mean? Well, in a in a scenario where you have ability, that can be I'm offering you the gospel, and you have the you've chosen to refuse it, um, you know, and you could choose you could choose to accept it or not accept it based on your nature. You're not fallen enough to have a total inability. If you have a total inability, I can offer you up the gospel, you know, 94 different ways, give you you know the best apologetic arguments in the world, and you know everything else, and you're never going to believe unless you're regenerate, and God changes your nature. So that's why the nature question has to come first uh, in these scenarios. So that would be, depending on what you understand, efficient grace, prevenient grace, what comes beforehand. Well, everybody's got scenarios. You have to hear the gospel. You have to hear it in meaningful ways. Um, there's work of the Holy Spirit that goes on prior to regeneration that produces conviction, terrors of conscience, as they're called in the literature. Prior to, now again, when you get to the actual decision, whether it's an Arminian or a Lutheran system where you have faith and then regeneration happens, or, you know, you have regeneration and then you can have faith, you know, that's where, you know, that's where you're, but that's going to be flipped on what total inability and total depravity actually means and what's going to be necessary after that. So, all right, question. Well, and then I try not to do that in class because, uh, uh, yeah, I know some, some people do that, but uh, uh, only because, look, we've we got a mixed scenario here, and what I'm trying to do is objectively put everybody's view out there in the best way I can. And uh, I said that's even the problem of trying to choose a textbook. Uh, you know, like I said, that at some point, you know, like I said, you have five different types of theologies here, somebody's going to be unhappy with a textbook. Uh, so, I mean, for, I mean, for example, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, um, for example, I tell you the, um, uh, all, you get these views books too, there's always one that's just better argued in the book, uh, even though, why didn't you use a different views book? Because, you know, my position wasn't well represented there or something. Uh, so, 
Now, all right, I'll give you, f I'll assign 50 textbooks for the courses, <laughs> and uh, you know, um, you know, I, I, I can do that. But now, if you want to talk to me about my view, come, come see me privately, and you know, again, uh, on discretionary views, I try not to take a position in class, and the fact that you have to ask me that, I think it's just, I'm keeping it as objective as I can, so, uh, so I appreciate that, so. All right, but the, um, um, one thing before we move on, I don't see any more questions, but again, the point is, look, look we're doing this from the Bible, we're, we're, and that's why we gotta take everything that God says and apply it to the question. And, you know, the certainty of divine foreknowledge, by the way, God makes foreknowledge a defining characteristic of who he is. If you don't know the future, you're not God, period. And this comes out forcefully in a number of places in the Bible, but it comes out frequently in the servant songs section of Isaiah. Um, and for example, in uh, Isaiah chapter 41, um, I'm just going to read parts of it here. It says, verse 21, present your case the Lord says. Bring forth your strong arguments. The king of Jacob says, let them bring forth and declare to us what is going to take place. And for the former events, declare what they were, that we may consider them and know their outcome or announce what is coming. Declare the things that are going to come afterwards, that we may know that you are God's. Well, you can't declare with certainty what's going to come afterward. You're not God. So God, God makes the certainty of divine foreknowledge a, a defining characteristic of who the true and the living God is. And then he goes on to say, um, declare the things that are going afterwards, that we may know that you're God's. Indeed, do good, do evil, that we may anxiously look about us and fear together. Behold, you're no account. Your, your works amount to nothing. He who chooses you is an abomination. So, so God's pretty uh, unhappy with open theism. Uh, so, um, yeah. I'm trusting, um, or as you said before, that God, based on his character, he would choose to create the best possible world. Mm -hmm. So then would that mean that he has compatible free will if he will always do what's in nature with his character? And that's on just well, saying things are possible. Again, I, I don't even think you have to go there because... Every, whether you're a libertarian or a compatibilist, and the problem is, is that, look, everybody's going to, you talk to, what, you know, see, what is libertarian free will? Some um, people are going to define it a little differently. Like, you know, what's really that, what is, was really, what is really libertarian mean? Well, it means spontaneity, okay? Uh, that literally any moment you could do this, you know, knock over the bottle or do something like that. So you're going to get different writers. They're going to sort of, well, what is that? essence of counterfactuals or something. And same thing with um, compatibilism. Again, that's going to get flushed out in different ways, too. So um, the whole point is you just go right back to, doesn't matter what kind of nature you have, a thing can't act against its own nature and is limited by its own nature what it can do. Mm -hmm. So that's why even that question, you know, does God have compatibilist or libertarian? Well, it's like the dog. It doesn't matter if a dog has compatibilist or libertarian free will. He can't choose Christ, and he can't choose to engage in the Calvinist-Arminian debate. Uh, so whatever nature God has, which we know what it is, it's immutable, it's perfected, it's eternal, it's infinite, it's holy, uh, it's all these things. This is who he is. He has all knowledge of every proposition, image, you know, uh, everything that could possibly be. So, so if that's where, for me, I don't even, I don't even see, it's, it's the liberty of nature, necessity of nature issue for God. And because God is this kind of being, asking whether he's got libertarian or you know, compatibilist kind of free will isn't, just doesn't even change the scenario. Well, yeah, well, can we have greater freedom than God? I mean, I've, I, again, it depends what that means. They say we certainly don't have a greater nature than God. Uh, I, think, I think you'd argue whatever conclusion you'd come to on what kind of freedom we have, arguably probably that's probably what God has too. 
but that has but that has to be answered in light of the liberty of nature and necessity of nature question. So so that's why, um, and like I said, just use the dog analogy where it becomes look, God's immutably holy. So you know whether he has libertarian free will or not doesn't matter that you know he can't sin. You know so so when you get into those kind of scenarios, he's still limited by his nature. Uh, God can't choose to be evil. God can't choose. So is that an alternative possibility? No. Uh, so, so that's why you have those kinds of questions that are frequently raised in the, in the discussion. Like I said, you go back to the more foundational issues and then apply it, and then I, I think that it answers the question. So, yeah. Yep. Well. Yeah. For me, like I said, the problem is there. See, so you're in the applied areas. I just go back to these scenarios I just laid out, and uh, you know, and you just start with the certainty of divine foreknowledge, you know, go to Isaiah 46, I do this, I do that. Well, it's just those specific interest instances, really. The point is you keep going is, you know, I see, so he knows the number of hairs on our head, you know, Ephesians 1.11, God works all things after the counsel of his will, okay? So shut up, okay? So, <laughs> uh, yeah, the point is, is that, look, you know, they keep trying to, you know, have some wiggle room or not that. Well, how about Acts 2.23? By the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men. You know, something that specific. Well, that one, how could God have an eternal certain knowledge of that? However many years, what, you know, six, 10,000, whatever, however many years it is after Adam, 20,000 years. How many, quote, free choices had to come together from the first one Adam made to every interactive free choice and scenario that ever went on in the world up to that moment where Christ would be crucified and you know, not run over by an ox cart when he was four. You know, uh, or that he wouldn't even be born because you know, his family line was wiped out. So that's why it's even, you know, t you're, you're trying to save a scenario that A, doesn't really answer the questions it's supposed to answer because that's where you just pose, you know, right back to the, you know, Romans 9, the potter and the clay. You know, what if God made us without any free will? You know, but, you know what if he made some vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? You know, he did. So basically, who are you to complain? Who are you to question God? See, that's Paul's argument. You know, so that's why the scenarios here, some of us get so fixed on theodicy, justifying God. You know, same thing with the problem of evil and these kinds of things. Well, God permitted evil, and I'm good with that, you know, because God's God. But if you have a God you think you can question, you know, then I'd, I'd say you probably don't even really understand monotheism. You're not a monotheist at this point. You're probably not even a, a believer, sorry, because you're questioning God for who God really is. And if God did it this way, I'm going to withhold commitment and belief. Well, good luck, okay? Okay. Um, you know, so that's why I think these things, and when I handle them, I just bring it back to the foundations, and it's a lot easier to deal with once you've laid that intellectual ground. You know, it's like dealing with a Mormon. If you're here trying to argue Book of Mormon versus X, forget that. Go to total apostasy and Joseph Smith the prophet and that stuff. Then you don't have to get to five layers down the road, you know, what, what they're thinking or doing, okay? Other, who else is uh, you and then you? Well, no, you, you, and then you. So go ahead. Go ahead. I hear. Well, 
Well, again, that, that, that's a good question to flesh every aspect of that out. That's where we're really getting to atonement, soteriology, and sort of the doctrine of sin, the purpose of man, and anthropology. Everyone is, and even when we talk about the will of God, having a desire versus actually making the choice to accomplish something. God has multiple desires. God desires to be just. God desires to be holy. God desires to, you know, have, the, you know, these kinds of things. So, but at the same time, you know, every scenario with, that people choose, there's going to be an actual choice to enact X. In one sense, the entire human race, because we're made in the image of God, our design is to have a relationship with God, period, by design. And just being in the class of being in the human race, we're designed to be with God. Uh, but at the same time, people freely choose to sin. So you could, forget the original sin issue. You scrap original sin. You know, how many angels fell without, you know, having original sin, all right? So people still freely choose to sin. You could take away our quote-unquote sin nature and our self-inclination. And guess what? People would still sin. Uh, so... And still choose other than what God said. But, but that particular passage, and again, you read commentaries on it. The whole point is, at one point in our lives, we were not God's people. We had to make a choice to become God's people. Uh, but in that scenario, vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, yeah, God in eternity knew he would create people who would never be saved. And that's why the freedom issue, what people are concerned about is, look, is this just in the sense, yeah, they made their own choices. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, the fact is, it depends what you mean. Look, for that purpose, remember, his purpose is he intends to make this world with every, everything in it which is his purpose generally. But again, you have to subdivide, and we're going to do this after lunch. The phrase, the will of God, has about eight different meanings to it. I mean, literally. So when you say he purposed, for example, um, God has a normative moral will that never changes. This is the way things ought to be. He has a permissive will of God. He permits his mutable, free-choice creatures to choose differently from his normative moral will. Okay, so we, and you could substitute the word purpose for will there and say, you know, what do you mean by his purpose? Uh, it can mean, you know, the desires that, that God has in his, you know, uh, you know, in his attributes. Yeah, but this is why, you know, everybody at some point in their life has to work through what Job, you know, what Abraham, the judge of the whole earth, will do what is right, okay? Whatever ha I'm not in a position to know God's sufficient moral reasons for doing X, Y, or Z as a creature. But based on what I do know and is clear, there is a creator. I'm a creature. He's done this. The Bible's clear, uh, you know, that, that, that these things are the way they are. For the, and again, the hidden will of God, stuff he hasn't told us yet, okay, stuff that hasn't occurred yet, this is where the idea of trust uh, comes in. You know, I, I, I know that God is good and God is this, and, you know, and at that point you kind of move forward and say, and I still, at some point I'd like to know, but at the same time I have to say, look, God is God, and that was his decision. I, I don't know. I'd have to look at that. But, uh, but the idea of preparing, uh, again, it still has some sense of foreordination. And it, forget the specifics on that. It comes in advance. Prepare. Uh, so that, that's the, if you want a, a very a minimalist understanding, whether active or passive or something, it's prepared in advance. And remember, right back to the scenario, we don't exist at this time. Only God exists. He thinks about the possible things he can make, and he decides to make the world that he wants to make. Okay. And then... We see, you know, everything that God decrees <clears throat> is going to come to pass. So, you know, for that, time for about one more question before lunch here, if you have any more. Yeah.
Well, yeah, because perceptual knowledge there by definition, as I'm using it here, would mean something that's external to God and, and it's a posteriori kind of knowledge. It's, it's from some kind of external sense experience or something. Uh, on this scenario, there is nothing external to God, so we can't have perceptual knowledge. By definition, yeah, he would have a concept of the world that he designed, that he conceived of, but it doesn't actually come to be until the creation event. And even then, uh, you know, you didn't come into existence, you know, until whatever your mom and dad, you know, did what moms and dads do and, uh, you know, uh, all that. You, you didn't exist at the first moment of ex nihilo creation. You know, the physical stuff particles, things like that may have existed that eventually might become your body. Uh, but, uh, you know, but even the whole point is there's a chronology even to bringing this stuff into existence, organizing it, fashioning it, you know, and carrying out the order of the decree. So, uh, so that's where, yeah, you, you, God would have to have a conceptual knowledge only before creation. And after that, he'd have a conceptual and a perceptual knowledge. Okay. My other question is in regards to um, certainty of mindfulness under Sakyamunism. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I, I do not trust how we can maintain that faith secret. I mean, people are choosing well, to respond to their intellect. It's free, because remember what is free? It's d I erased it up there already, but free minimally means free from immediate, external, efficient causation. Your, the movement of your intellect and will is not moved directly and immediately by an external agent cause, you know, and it's the efficient cause. Like I'm sitting here, push my water bottle, say my, push, my, my finger pushing it is the efficient cause of the movement of the water bottle, okay? Um, point is, is that, see, both the compatibilist, now the determinist would say, yeah, that's what, you move your will, that's what's going on. See, something or someone is basically doing this uh, and doing that, you know, pushing your will or an intellect one way or the other. So your thoughts and choices are only the effects of something external to you, okay? They're not self-moved. Where the compatibilist says, no, we are free from ex immediate external efficient causation. And as they hold to secondary free causation, God may be the first cause in everything in acting out the divine decree and divine providence, but the movement of our intellects and wills are really self-caused. Okay? We, as act agents and souls and so forth, are the efficient cause of our thoughts and choices, not by anything external to us. So the compatibilist says anything more than you know, that, that's all you need for freedom, we're free from external efficient causation. So that's free choice. But the, art, but, but the libertarian says, no, that's meaningless because it's, you know, again, there's, you can't be otherwise, so what meaningfulness is there to the freedom? So you have to have counterfactuals of freedom. But the compatibilist says, yeah, grounding objection, okay? Then what's the ground for divine certainty? Uh, because if you really can choose otherwise, then how is there a one-to-one -one correspondence with God's idea and proposition and the mind-independent reality? If you really can choose otherwise at any given moment, uh, you, uh, God can only have a high certainty. Uh, and again, that's where the, actually the grounding objections, uh, the compatibilist essentially says grounding objection. Uh, so we're scrapping counterfactuals of freedom. There is no a principle of alternative possibility. So what you've got now is so what we're going to maintain the certainty of divine foreknowledge and scrap alternative possibility. The open theists also think the grounding objection is forceful and persuasive, but what they scrap is the certainty of divine foreknowledge. You're right, it can't ground, uh, it, it can't ground divine certainty, but libertarian free will is so important we're keeping that but scrapping divine certainty. Okay. 
Well, that, that's exactly what the compatibilists, the Molinists, the simple foreign knowledge Arminians sit there and debate left and right. On the, you know, again, the, the compatibilists and the open theists thinks it's a great arg it's a great argument, uh, you know. And um, uh, but the the libertarian, either simple free knowledge or uh, or Molinist Arminians don't think it's a good argument, and they think that the grounding objection can be overcome in a number of ways. Uh, so the question is, is you know, if you really if you really have alternative possibility, the question is, can you have divine certainty? Okay, will there be, like I said, one to one correspondence with this? And once God creates the external world, is that tr remember truth is correspond is considered correspondence theory here, that God conceives of this proposition, and that it actually corresponds with what actually occurs, what's going to happen, in the, what, it, what is occurring or what will occur in the real world. What's the ground for that? Okay. So, so anyway, that's, those are the basics on that. All right, we are ready for lunch, so have a swell lunch.